Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Dr. Stephanie Van will be speaking about back pain causes and treatments. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you're comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenter. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. Please note this program is being recorded. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Stephanie Van to begin our presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today, and it's an honor to be speaking. Uh, today, my talk is going to be on the basics of back pain, what causes back pain, and commonly what solutions or treatments are going to be offered. I'm Dr. Stephanie Van. I appreciate the kind introduction. I'm a pain management specialist with Johns Hopkins Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and I'm excited to provide an overview today of this issue that is super common and I talk about every day at work. So hopefully after this session, my goal is to help you understand the common causes of back pain, uh, lifestyle changes that you can control uh, that help treat and prevent back pain, various medication and injection strategies that I offer all the time for back pain, and when to consider surgery for back pain. So a nice broad overview of these very important topics. Um, I wanna emphasize that I'm not giving any personalized medical advice today. These are more just general guidelines and overview so that when you go to your doctor and wanna talk about your specific issues, you'll kind of know the jargon, what to talk about, what questions to ask and what to expect. So hopefully this is helpful for everybody. So I wanted to dive into how back pain feels. Back pain is one of the most common disabling symptoms that people experience throughout their lifetimes. And back pain can feel all different sorts of ways. Um, if you think of any of the common words of how your pain feels or when you've heard someone else complain about their back pain, um, that's a big clue that doctors use to try to figure out what is causing the back pain. So if you just think of some common words, they'll probably pop up here on my next slide. Um, and then I can kind of talk about how we figure out how uh, how uh, those words translate into what parts of the back are potentially injured. Okay, so just waiting for my slides here. So I hear a lot of people describe their back pain as achy, sharp, sore, tight, throbbing, pulsing. But then there's other types of words that sound a little stranger, like burning, electrical, shooting sensitive, numb, tingling, even depressing. Um, so there's all these different types of terms that you'll hear thrown around as to how to describe back pain. And I wanna emphasize again that each of these words kind of tells me, oh, it might be one part of the back versus the other that's injured or uh, bothered. So I wanna go over the, the major structures of the back and their characteristics. Um, so muscles are sort of the most common things that can get injured in back pain. Um, I think of muscles in the back as layers of a cake. Um, you've got big ones and small ones all layered around your back and around your spine, and they help keep our trunk stable while we're doing our regular daily activities and our exercises. So muscles need to be strengthened and stretched, um, and they can be strained and pulled and, you know, they can go into spasm uh, and then they can go into cramping. So they can cause a significant amount of pain. And if a muscle is irritated or strained, any little movement of that muscle is going to feel really painful. Typically people with muscle pain will tell me that they have a soreness, they have a tenderness, little movements are really painful. Um, and typically like things like heat or massage or rest, are all helpful. So those are all clues that make me think, oh, this person definitely has a component of muscle pain. Bone pain in the back is a, you know, it's the anatomy is a little more complicated. So sometimes it's harder for people to understand, but I like to think of the bones of the 
back or the spine as being a tunnel. So it's a tunnel made up of blocks of bone that are all stacked up against each other. I, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but each of these vertebrae are like bony blocks and then stacked up together, um, they form a tunnel. And so this artwork here is kind of like a close up as if we're looking down a tunnel. And as you can see with any tunnel, there's windows on the side and those windows are where nerve roots shoot out into our arms and our legs. And then the main part of the tunnel is where the spinal cord is. That's the main power cord of the body. Um, so if you just think of a tunnel and you think of nice wide open spaces where nerves travel, then you basically have a good understanding of spinal anatomy. And of course, between the bones, there are intervertebral discs. And those are like squishy brake pads, essentially, for your spine. All right. And then the last major component of the back or the spine that can cause pain are the nerves, of course. So like I said, the spinal cord is the main power cord. It's a bundle of nerves, like a highway of nerves traveling up and down your back. And then exiting out of each tunnel in the spine are nerve roots going to the arms and the legs, as you can see in the diagram here. And the nerves are the type of uh, tissue in the body that can cause that weird shooting, electrical numbness, tingling pain, because nerves send pain signals. And when the nerves are irritated, the pain signals get either exaggerated or, you know, it's not just straightforward achiness um, or like soreness. I forgot to mention um, when the bones of the spinal tunnel are uh, causing pain or irritated, usually it's from things like arthritis, you know, wear and tear in the back and Associated words with that are like stiffness, um, decreased range of motion, um, difficulty kind of getting up out of a seat if you've been sitting for a long time, uh, things of that nature. And then of course there's fractures. Bones can be fractured or broken, maybe a compression fracture if you have osteoporosis. And that can also be very like stiff and sharp um, and painful with every movement. So that's bone pain, very different from nerve pain. Um, nerve pain can be caused by lots of different things. And I would say the most common thing I see is when a nerve doesn't have as much space in the tunnel as it should or wants to have. So um, maybe arthritis of the bones has narrowed the space in the tunnel. Maybe a disc has herniated out of place and is pushing on a nerve root that's traveling in the tunnel. That is what commonly irritates nerves. But other things can irritate nerves like inflammatory diseases of the nervous system, like multiple sclerosis, for example. Okay. This is just a slide kind of going over what I was saying before. Um, when there's muscle pain, people usually describe this as achy, sore, tender, tight, maybe muscle spasm or muscle knots uh, that are relieved with heat or massage commonly. Bone pain tends to be achy, stiff or sharp. And it's usually due to things like arthritis or if there's a history of trauma, could also be fractures. And then nerve pain tends to feel burning, electrical, sensitive, tingling, and shooting. There's another type of pain that I broadly classify as centralized pain, and that can play into any of these other structures that are damaged. But what, what differentiates centralized pain in my mind is that the pain associated with these injuries or these parts of the body are out of proportion and much more severe than what we might see on a diagnostic image. So say someone doesn't have a significant injury on their MRI of their back, for example, but they're really having severe debilitating pain, I consider there to also be a component of centralized pain because the nervous system, the central nervous system, that's the brain and the spinal cord might be hypersensitized to a pain signal. Um, even when it's a good thing, we can't find a huge tissue injury on our diagnostics. So I know that's kind of a fuzzy uh, concept, uh, but it's definitely something I see a lot in pain management. So when you go to your doctor's office and you, um, want to start talking about your pain, your doctor is going to ask you these very specific questions about your pain. One, of course, what does the pain feel like? So you're going to give your doctor all of your descriptors, but the doctor also really wants to know where specifically is your pain and is it traveling anywhere? And that might follow some anatomical distributions of, um, known referred patterns of pain, uh, timing of the pain. Is it worse in the morning, like a lot of stiffness in the morning, or is it worse at the end of the day? Um, or is it worse with any certain type of activity? The severity, usually people will be asked for pain severity on a scale from one to 10. Personally, I like to just hear severity in terms of how functionally limiting someone's pain is. So if someone isn't able to get up and take their daily walk that they usually like to do because of their pain, that's 
an indication of severity because it's functionally limiting someone. Whereas if someone's still able to work full time and they're still playing tennis every weekend, even though the pain is severe, it's, it's not at least functionally limiting them. Another hallmark of severity in my mind is if the pain wakes someone up from sleep, because I think that's a really significant interrupter of life. If you're not able to get a good night's sleep, it makes everything that you want to do in your life harder during the day. Um, and other important aspects of uh, telling the story of your pain with your doctor is what makes the pain worse and what have you tried that makes the pain better? Um, that'll help the doctor understand, hmm, okay, you've tried some of these strategies. Um, what new can we bring to the table? Also remember that your doctor is going to examine you, hopefully. Uh, a physical exam is a very important component of figuring out uh, what is behind causes of back pain. So your doctor should be checking your strength and sensation, um, usually in the legs and the arms. Those are the basic uh, extremities. Um, and functionally, I just have my patients kind of get up if they can, walk around, balance on one leg. Um, those are easy tests of strength and sensation. They'll check your reflexes. So they'll, you know, hit your knees with a hammer. Um, they might watch you walk, check for balance. They'll check for tenderness. So they might be pushing on structures in your lower back and your spine. Um, and they'll use special, special maneuvers to reproduce your pain. Um, so provoking pain in the lower back joints or the sacroiliac joints. Um, there'll be, there's something called the slump test or the straight leg raise where uh, basically, your doctor will have you bend at the waist, either lifting your leg up while you're sitting or laying flat on an exam table, and that stretches the nerves coming out of your lower back, um, and that usually tries to reproduce nerve or sciatica pain. Um, so hopefully, at least uh, when you go to the doctor and you, you're asking them about advice for back pain, they're taking a look at you on physical exam as well to get the most information about how they can help you with your pain. So uh, that was a quick overview of the three major structures in the back that cause pain and how they get evaluated at the doctor's office. We have the layers of the cake, which is your muscles. Uh, we have your bones and your discs that make up the spinal tunnel. And then of course we have the nerves, which send pain signals, but also signals for strength and sensation. Um, so hopefully that was a, a nice general overview of the major things that doctors are looking for to help you with. Okay, now I wanna to transition to uh, what we can all do as individuals to you know, improve our lifestyle and keep our backs healthy and, and keep back pain away. So I wanted to offer you some strategies and this is what I tell basically everyone who comes through my office with back pain. Um, I always advise them of what they can control so they can take care of their back. So there's a funny meme here. It's a guy who's clutching his back and it says, tired of carrying my sense of humor around all day. I just wanna address the elephant in the room um, because it is extremely difficult for everybody, especially these days it seems, to eat healthy, exercise, get enough sleep and manage stress. Um, it's like we all know that these are things that we could and should be doing to help ourselves, but um, it can be challenging sometimes. Life gets in the way, we have a lot of things to maintain. We don't have all the free time in the world to follow good advice. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and hopefully provide some strategies that helps it not seem so overwhelming. So we all have the same goal. If you came to this webinar, we want to manage back pain, control our back pain and prevent it from being the dominant force in our lives. So, um, even though everybody is not perfect, I want to just acknowledge that it's okay <laughs> that we're not all doing the best we can in terms of exercise, sleep, healthy eating. Um, and we have to forgive ourselves a little bit for that. Um, I think it helps to focus on one habit that you really feel like you can, and you want to change. It can be very small. Um, but I'm, if you've heard of smart goals, goals, um, Goals to really focus on to really make a change are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. So I usually give people about a month to say, let's focus on this one lifestyle thing we want to change that we know will help with your back pain. Um, so 30 days is a good sort of timeline and commitment. And that's a good way to also follow up with your doctor uh, who's helping you and supporting you throughout this process. After a month, you can look and appreciate your progress. Maybe you've kept a log of, of your progress. Say you, you committed you know, five minutes every weekday to your gentle home exercise program. Appreciate that you've even attempted to do that. And then after 30 days, 
hopefully you've stuck with it or you found a, another goal that you feel like would be more helpful to focus on and you just repeat the process. Everyone is a work in progress. So the lifestyle change that is number one that I recommend all the time is healthy, fun, and safe movements. Um, so the way to protect the back and minimize injury is avoiding anything that's deep bending, twisting, and lifting a heavy load. So uh, some, <laughs> some classic examples from everyday life, you know, people who are gardening and they're lifting like heavy bags of soil, for example, um, if you're not lifting those bags correctly, that can really be a strain on your back. Um, or, you know, some people say, oh, I have a new baby and it's really hard to lift up my child without feeling like I have back pain. That's really frustrating because obviously spending time with your child and, and being one-on-one -on -one is the priority. So um, I always prescribe a guided home exercise program to my patients because even if they can't make it to physical therapy, um, even if they're not a regular exerciser, uh, I try to give people gentle things that they can do, you know, in bed or like on their couch or while standing, gentle movements um, that engage their core and help lift strain off of their spine. Cause then that will help them for the rest of their, the day and the rest of their activities they wanna do in their life. Um, so, you know, pictured here is like a gentle, looks like a uh, chair yoga type class, um, but even regular stretching, regular mindful breathing, all of those movements uh, count and you should give yourself credit for those efforts. Uh, the next sort of lifestyle thing you can introduce easily are physical modalities. And these are things as simple as, you know, introducing a heating pad or an ice pack to sore areas of the back. Pictured here on the left are TENS units. Um, those are the electrodes that you can stick on your back and then you can crank up a little bit of electrical stimulation and that can modulate pain signals and help tense and relax muscles. And then on the right uh, is pictured some massage. Um, just basic, simple, easy things that you can introduce that actually can make a big impact. And the nice thing about physical modalities and gentle exercises, very, very low risk. Um, you, can, you can do them for very little cost, very little equipment. Sleep is a super important lifestyle change. Um, I always try to encourage people to have a regular sleep cycle because if you're well rested and you wake up refreshed, even if you are dealing with chronic back pain, you're just, your nervous system is better able to handle that and cope with that during the day. Um, things like sleep hygiene that I emphasize with people are, you know, minimizing screen time, at least a couple of hours before bed, avoiding stimulating things like caffeine or like even exciting TV shows before bed. Um, natural supplements like melatonin can help before bedtime. Um, and, and sometimes even doing like a little brain dump if people have a lot of thoughts running around in their mind and uh, they're not able to kind of settle their mind down. I have, I suggest people write down their, the things that are going on in their brain so that they can put, put them away and then get to them another time that can really help. Uh, nutrition. So, um, I wanted to emphasize that nutrition is, you know, food is medicine. Essentially. Um, we know that if we eat a lot of, you know, whole foods that have like natural nutrients and minimize the processing of, of our intake. Um, we can have more energy. We can uh, nourish ourselves with vitamins and minerals and not worry so much about weight loss. If, if our diet is already nice and clean um, weight loss is always a helpful thing uh, this day and age when we're, you know, dealing with um, limited access to, gyms right now, the pandemic has really impacted everyone's exercise routine. So um, I, I don't typically coach my patients about weight loss, but if they ask me specifically if they're interested in things, I, I always recommend um, consulting with a nutritionist and um, strategizing how to eat cleaner, how to eat healthier. Um, because if you're carrying around less weight, this is less strain on your back. Finally, I want to touch on coping strategies because, you know, back pain, it's not just an isolated topic. Um, back pain plays into every aspect of our lives. Um, it can be associated with depressed mood, uh, stressful things in life um, that sometimes are out of our control, financial stresses, um, all kinds of things, the pandemic. <laughs> so um, one thing that we can control is how we manage these stressful, frustrating, painful times. 
Um, pictured here on the left, I have someone journaling. Um, and then pictured on the right, I, there's someone meditating. Um, and typically, you know, if, if I can see someone's really dealing with this uh, impacting their pain, essentially, I always offer a referral to like a neuropsychologist or a therapist, counselor, a support group, because it's never, and anything that each of us are dealing with is never something we have to deal with by ourselves. Um, and so even if, you know, there's limited treatment options or you've tried everything, or it feels like, it feels like you're out of options. There's always someone you can connect with. There's always other people dealing with similar things. Um, and it's just a matter of reaching out and finding that support. So I wanted to emphasize that. <clears throat> okay. How are we doing on time? Doing okay. Uh, this next section of the talk just wants to touch on medications for back pain. And uh, I only wanted to make this a small portion of the talk because I feel like a lot of people think, oh, if I just you know, take a couple pills, take a different, take the right kind of medication, my back pain will go away. And I really wanted to emphasize in the last two sections that there are many things that play into back pain and medications are just a fraction of the strategies that we can offer. Um, so when it comes to medications, it's important to understand how to weigh the risks and benefits before starting a potentially helpful medication. So hopefully what I'm going to talk about is um, going to give you a better mindset and a better strategy when you do talk to your doctor about medications. So going over the causes of pain again, muscle pain, that bone pain, nerve pain, and centralized pain, there's actually corresponding medications for each of these categories. Um, and I'll just go through them. I'm, I'm not going to try to name too many names of medicines um, because that's too specific. So for muscle pain and bone pain, uh, most of the time, the, the types of meds that are offered are anti-inflammatories. Some of these are over the counter and some of these can be prescription strength. Um, and then of course, muscle pain, like muscles and spasm can benefit from muscle relaxants as well. Nerve pain medicines, um, actually can also overlap with medicines that help with seizure control, um, cause they help kind of decrease the signaling of the central nervous system. And as a result, that can definitely make people sleepy. And then when it comes to centralized pain and nerve pain as well, actually, there's some overlap here, um, but medications that in influence mood and psychology can help with both nerve pain and centralized pain. And I always try to pitch this to people saying that, yes, of course, mood can play into pain signaling, but also the, the ways that mood medicines boost our mood at lower doses, they can also kind of reinforce the nervous system to fight pain signals. So that's how I think of it. Just because I'm offering someone a medication that's um, that can be used for mood improvement doesn't mean I think their primary issue is a mood disorder like depression. Um, so we're always thinking about the type of pain that's causing someone's symptoms and the type of medicine that can kind of correspond to and address that pain directly. Medication basics, it's a, it can seem kind of complicated, but you know, with each medication, they ha always have these features. There's a generic name and a brand name. And typically uh, the brand names might be more expensive or they're just the newer version of them, but they essentially should be the same medicine. So for example, an over-the-counter version, ibuprofen is the generic for Advil. I think it's also called Motrin. Um, a medicine will always have an indication. In this case, we're talking about muscle pain or inflammation. Um, the formulation is just the form that it comes in. They can come in either chalky tablets that can be split, um, capsules that have liquid inside of them that can't be split, or like an oral liquid. The dose is very important. So Advil usually comes in doses that are milligrams, um, but each medicine has its own sort of characteristic dose range. And then frequency, how often are you taking a certain dose? With Advil, I'll usually say, mm, maybe take it three times a day with food as needed for back pain. That's sort of a general common frequency for anti-inflammatories. And of course, every medicine has side effects as well. So the most common side effect with ibuprofen or Advil, I would say is stomach irritation. So these are all things to watch out for if you're considering a new medicine or considering revising your current medicine regimen. Um, and hopefully your doctor is taking you through, especially the side effects and the indications. So you know what to watch out for. 
I uh, just want to give the general advice that it's it's prudent to keep an updated list of medicines, um, what they're for and how you take them. Some people use these pill organizer boxes. Some people just type out uh, their list. I've even seen people have some spreadsheets for their medication regimens because it can get complicated. So whatever system works best for you is the one that you're going to be able to stick with. And it's easy to communicate this with your healthcare providers. Okay, so with all of this knowledge, uh, hopefully you're gonna be working with your healthcare providers to optimize your medication regimen. Sometimes medicines can do more than just one thing. For example, there's some nerve pain medicines that can help with nerve pain and mood and sleep. So sometimes, you know, the the drowsiness side effect of a lot of nerve pain medications that can be beneficial, especially if someone's having difficulty sleeping and they have nerve pain. Just an example. You can also consider the timing of your medicine. So say you have a medicine that you take as needed, um, but you don't want to take it all the time, maybe due to side effects. Perhaps you can work with your doctor to come up with a schedule of, oh, I'm going to take this 30 minutes before my physical therapy session. And that maximizes the benefit of the medicine. You can also consider simplifying your medication regimen um, so that you're not taking medicines that you feel aren't really benefiting you. Um, and you can come off of them safely in case they need to be weaned. I'd like to just mention opioids real quick as their special class of medicines, because in pain medicine, opioids are obviously the heavy duty painkillers. Um, so I just wanted to go a little bit more in depth on this so that you have some good knowledge about opioids. Opioids have a time and a place. They're very good painkillers when it comes to acute pain, like if you get into a car accident or you just had major surgery, and they're often used uh, in terminal conditions like advanced cancer. So very good painkillers um, reserved for those significant situations because they shut down the major pain pathway. Um, but if you may have noticed, I didn't say that they actually address any particular cause of pain. So they're not necessarily anti-inflammatory. They don't help calm down irritated nerve pain signals. They just shut down the pain signaling pathway. And then when they wear off, the pain comes back essentially unchanged. The pain could even come back worse. Um, so that's why they're not really useful in long-term pain management, um, because they're not a sustainable solution to address sources of pain. Um, this is another reason why they're at high risk for habit forming behavior, because your body can kind of really like the pain signaling system getting shut down. Um, and that is considered sort of a biological reward for the brain system. So, um, people experience both physical and psychological dependence with opioids, um, with long-term use, they can even sensitize the nervous system. So the more you use opioids, the more sensitive you are to tissue damage and pain signaling. Um, and of course, other common side effects of opioids are like drowsiness, constipation, um, just basically side effects that really aren't worth the benefits with long-term use. So um, hopefully that gave you some good information about opioids and a better understanding of why in pain medicine, you know, we, we can still use opioids. There's a safe way to use opioids as a last resort, um, but it's definitely not the first, second or third choice uh, when it comes to managing back pain. Okay, so this last section of the talk, we're doing pretty good on time. Um, I'm gonna go over injections for back pain. Um, I'm just gonna go over th three major types of injections for back pain so that uh, you have a good understanding of these three. And then of course, um, you can always speak with your healthcare providers about other options that might be specific for you. Um, and of course, any intervention, there are potential risks and benefits. So we'll go over those. So the major types of injections for back pain, um, I'd say the, the least invasive one are called trigger point injections, which are usually done for tight, sore muscle pains. Facet blocks and ablations are done for joint pains, um, and that's the spinal joints. And then epidural steroid injections are for irritated nerve pains like sciatica when there's narrowing around a nerve root. So I'm going to go through each of these one at a time. Oh, but... Before we get into the details, any injection, which is a needle piercing the skin, there's always a risk of infection. So we have to make sure the skin is clean and sterile. Um, there's always a risk of bleeding. So you want to make sure we're avoiding any major blood vessels um, and your doctor's going to know your anatomy and avoid those areas. 
And of course, there's always risk of injury to surrounding structures. So especially with these more invasive injections, we use imaging guidance like x-ray or ultrasound to make sure we're avoiding major significant structures that we don't want to be hitting with the needle. So trigger point injections are for tight muscles. I kind of describe them to patients as it's similar to acupuncture where we're taking a tight sore muscle and pictured here is sort of the upper back, like the trapezius region. So many people hold stress in the trapezius, rhomboid and sort of neck, cervical paraspinal region. Um, we make sure the skin is nice and clean. We find those trigger points or those knots in the muscle. We put a thin needle in and we inject some numbing medicine, basically short and long acting lidocaine. Uh, similar to what you would get at the dentist, but it's going into a muscle instead. And numbing the muscle this way and kind of poking it with a needle, um, that does a couple of things. It flushes out the area and usually provides immediate relief within a few minutes after the injection, um, which is already very nice. Um, even though the numbing medicine is temporary and tends to wear off after a day, this can also provide sort of a a reset so the muscle stays relaxed and it, it can break a pain cycle. Um, so if the pain does come back, um, maybe it doesn't come back in full force or it takes a while to kind of build back up again. Um, so these are very satisfying to do since you can get a lot of relief right away um, and they're very safe to do. So they can be done in a clinic setting. Um, and then here's just some text on everything I just kind of spoke about. Um, you're finding a tender, tight muscle really located by palpation and touch. You're injecting some numbing medicine. Uh, you're needling a little bit to release tension in the muscle, break up tight muscle fibers. Um, and you're careful not to insert the needle too deep or into structures that we don't wanna be poking with the needle. Um, all right, so that's trigger point injections. The next major type of procedure for back pain is called a facet block. Um, and so these pictured here um, is the lower spine bones. Um, and where these two bones here are interlocking at this purple area, this is called the facet joint. So these are one of the many small little joints all along your spine. And just like any joint, you can develop arthritis here, wear and tear, normal with age. Um, and if someone has a lot of arthritis in their spine and, you know, they've tried anti-inflammatories, they've tried gentle home exercises and, and things still really aren't improving. What you can do is you can use x-ray guidance, go to the joint, numb the joint with numbing medicine. And for the rest of that day, if someone has significant relief of their back pain, this was a positive test. So facet block is a test to see whether numbing the joint in the spine improves back pain temporarily. If it does, then you know that that's a good target. And then you can bring someone back, go back to those nerve targets of those joints. And instead of just numbing them, you ablate them or burn them with gentle heat. This is called a radiofrequency ablation. Um, and this can provide prolonged pain relief, six months, sometimes even longer, where someone has improved pain, they may not need as much pain medicine, they may get more out of their um, home exercise regimen. Um, so this is a really nice, minimally invasive uh, strategy that minimizes other things like medication requirements. So here's just more text about facet blocks. Remember, it's the test injection first. Sometimes, unfortunately, the test injections don't result in improved back pain, and then you have to re-strategize. But if they are a good test of, or if they are a good reliever of back pain, then you can proceed with the ablation. So facet blocks are done using x-ray guidance. Um, and then if the blocks are helpful, you bring the person back, you put your needles in the same place, but the special needles uh, for the ablation have little heated tips. And so that's how the nerves get gently zapped with heat. And then it takes about six months, sometimes more for those nerves to grow back. All right, and then probably another, one of the most common injections that is done for back pain are epidural steroid injections. And these are done for irritated nerves that are in a small tight spinal tunnel. Maybe they're being pinched by a um, herniated disc or something like that. Um, and so you see here a needle going not to the joints, which are pictured here, but just inside the spinal tunnel. Um, and the goal here is to inject a combination of numbing medicine and steroid medicine, because steroids are very powerful anti-inflammatories. They can calm down a tight, irritated nerve. Okay, so similar to facet blocks, epidural steroid injections use x-ray guidance to put the needle in the right place. Like I said, you're injecting a combination of numbing and steroid or anti-inflammatory medicine. Um, 
but they, they do provide just temporary relief. So I usually tell people we expect these to last up to three months. Um, sometimes they don't last as long. Sometimes they last longer. But the goal during this period of temporary pain relief is to maximize your gentle home exercise program, maybe get more out of physical therapy, and hopefully stabilize and maintain the strength of your spine so that the spaces in your spinal tunnel don't get narrowed again. Um, one of the big downsides to steroid injections and steroids as medications in general, um, they have a lot of side effects. So they can increase your blood sugar, um, which especially for diabetics, you can have your blood sugar be harder to control for up to four weeks after a dose of steroids. Steroids are very stimulating. They can cause more anxiety, insomnia, appetite, um, and a lot of people can experience weight gain or like swelling of their legs, which is definitely not desirable. Um, and if, you, you're, if you're using steroids for a prolonged period of time, um, these can risk muscle atrophy, tendon thinning, and decrease bone density, which again, uh, undesirable. So we try to really reserve steroids for when we really need them. Um, and usually people don't get more than about four epidural steroid injections a year. So about one every three months. And so what happens if all of these injections, all of these medications, all these lifestyle changes, you've tried them all, but things still aren't progressing to a satisfactory level, or you're still having functional impact, your pain is still persistent. Um, I'd say that's usually when we consider a surgical consultation. So when conservative measures fail to offer functional benefit, or the other reason to consider surgery um, is more in an emergency situation when um, someone who has known wear and tear in their spine experiences a sudden loss of strength, sensation, or bladder or bowel control. Um, that can be concerning for like a sudden disc herniation or other significant narrowing or injury of the spine, like after a trauma, like a fall. Um, that needs immediate medical attention and you would be recommended to go to an emergency room for imaging and possibly a surgical decompression. Um, what I'll say about surgery is that no medical or surgical treatment is risk-free uh, or guarantees satisfaction. So it's always recommended in cases of chronic, common run-of-the-mill back pain to exhaust all of the conservative strategies I talked about earlier first um, before considering uh, a surgical procedure that is not reversible. So surgical decompression can physically open up the spaces in the tunnel. Um, so definitely uh, it has its indications, um, but it's the most invasive and most risky. So um, it's always a good idea to talk to your doctor about surgery if you're thinking about it. Um, it's always a good idea to get a referral to a surgeon if you have questions that are surgery sp specific so that you can get your questions answered. Um, it never hurts to have more information because then you can make the most informed decisions about uh, what strategies you want to try next. All right, so you've been hearing me talk for a long time and I just wanna emphasize that um, no matter what we offer, no matter what we discuss, um, my personal goal to help someone with back pain is to keep them focused on their function and their quality of life and to really maximize that, come up with a treatment plan that is compatible with someone's lifestyle. Um, so I hope that you found this helpful. Um, <laughs> I am very open to asking or answering any of your questions that you have. Um, and if you're interested in seeking a consultation with me or any of the other specialists uh, at our practice, there will be a phone number at the end of this slide, I believe. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions through the rest of this webinar. And uh, thank you so much for listening. All right, so I'll be going through some of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat here. Okay, so um, good first question to start off with is what type of doctor should we go to first to deal with our back pain, a pain management doc, an orthopedic doc, or an internist? Um, and that's a great question because it's kind of like all of these people overlap a little bit. Uh, we share a lot of the same responsibility. Um, I would say the first step is always if you have a good relationship with a primary care doctor, um, definitely that's the first person you can mention your back pain to. Um, but if you don't, then I would suggest you still establish care with a primary care doctor anyway for your general health. Um, 
But even a primary care doctor can recommend physical therapy and some of the conservative strategies that I discussed earlier, and they can provide you with a referral. Um, but when it talks, when, when we think about specialists, a pain management doctor is usually a good uh, person to talk with next. And they're the ones who can offer that higher level of an interventions like injections for back pain. Um, an orthopedic doc, uh, I would say orthopedics you know, you can specialize in orthopedics if you have a background in family medicine or physical medicine and rehab, um, or if you did a residency in orthopedic surgery. Um, so I can see why there's a lot of confusion surrounding that. Um, I think the most important thing is to understand if who you're going to, if they're a back pain specialist, are they surgical or are they interventional? Um, because if you're going to a surgeon, then you kind of know your encounter is going to be focused on surgery or not. Whereas if they're more of an interventionalist or if they're not a surgeon, they'll be able to offer you a little bit more of a broader range of strategies. Um, I hope that that was a helpful overview of who you might consult with for back pain. Uh, another question here is what are the best treatments for sacral pain not related to the SI joint? Um, so to clarify, the SI joint is the sacroiliac joint, and that's the joint basically between your tailbone and your hip bone. So you have one on each side, and it's a big joint at the base of your spine. So you can imagine if you get arthritis there, it can be very painful. Um, but then this question is asking me about sacral pain that's not related to the SI joint, um, which is interesting because that's a very broad range of things. You could have you know, you could have tailbone pain, you could have a sacral fracture from a fall, you could have um, ligament strain in the sacrum, um, you, or you could have pelvic pain that's kind of more related to internal organs. So it's a, that's a very broad question. Um, and I would say that the best person to consult with is sort of a, a, a pain management specialist, maybe an interventionalist who can delve into more specifics about your pain so that you can come up with the best, most targeted strategy. Okay. I'm getting some great questions. So another question here is how much does fibromyalgia affect recovery after lumbar surgery? Um, and fibromyalgia is a great thing to ask a pain doctor about because I think historically fibromyalgia has had sort of a bad reputation um, as being kind of like an umbrella diagnosis and doctors don't really have a good answer to it. I consider fibromyalgia to be, you know, um, Obviously, there's components of muscle and fascial pain, um, but then there's also a pain of cent there's also a component of centralized pain or hypersensitivity to pain. So usually in fibromyalgia, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's not like there's been a big injury or a lot of tissue damage, um, but still there's there's functionally limiting pain. So I would say that if you have fibromyalgia or another underlying syndrome that causes hypersensitization of pain, you just have to be more prepared when you know your body might be undergoing a stress. Um, so a stress like a lumbar surgery or any other type of procedure, um, your body might be more reactive to, to that and have a heightened pain response to that. Um, so I would suggest working with your pain specialist to kind of reinforce your pain medication regimen, um, reinforce your coping strategies before and after surgery so that you're anticipating a, a potential pain flare or a heightened pain response. Okay. Okay. Um, shifting gears a little bit, there's a question here. Can you speak about prolotherapy, PRP, or stem cell therapy? That is a good question. The reason I didn't throw that in there is because Technically, these are all still experimental offerings, um, and so I want to emphasize that we have very scant evidence at this current moment, and this is not something that I, you know, routinely recommend. It's not as evidence based, um, but prolotherapy, platelet rich plasma therapy or stem cell therapy are all forms of regenerative medicine, which essentially means we take stem cells from a source like uh, in our blood or from our bone marrow, uh, we spin them down, and then we re-inject these stem cells from our, you know, our patient's own bodies back into areas of injury. Um, the best experimental evidence we have right now are in big joints like the knee or the hip or for tendons, um, but we really don't have any evidence that this is um, functionally beneficial, especially not in the spine. I would say that if someone is offering 
someone regenerative medicine for back pain or spine health, I would be very, very, very cautious because I have actually not seen that turn out too well. Um, I've seen patients under my care or in the hospital who have underwent that. And honest, honestly, it's it can be an unnecessary risk, um, especially since the cost is out of pocket and we don't have good evidence for it. I would recommend honestly against it for back pain. Um, hmm. That being said, the evidence we do have for things like knee pain or hip pain, we know that injection of stem cells into these big joints can prompt regrowth or inflammation and, and stirring of, of cell growth. We don't know if those cells are usable muscle, usable um, meniscus, usable joint tissue. We can just see that there is some growth there. So I hope that that's helpful and not too, too vague. Um, but essentially we don't know enough about prolotherapy, PRP or stem cell therapy. So honestly, stay away from it if someone's offering it to you for back pain because the risks do not outweigh the benefits. Okay, another question here. Is a chiropractor good to see? I have both muscle and bone pain. And I think that's a great question. Um, I think chiropractic is a very helpful supplement. It can be for sure, um, especially if you have a good relationship with the chiropractor, if um, they're willing to kind of listen and, and teach and offer an explanation of what they're offering for you. Um, I think the thing to watch out for in chiropractic is to really um, minimize any high velocity movements. So that's things like snapping joints, uh, snapping the spine. I just don't feel like those high velocity adjustments um, are offering significant benefit versus the potential risk of you know, causing tissue injury or dislocation or ligament strain. Um, that I always try to caution patients against high velocity maneuvers. That being said, um, it's definitely a modality that's worth exploring. I consider it, you know, on par with things like myofascial release and, um, osteopathic manipulation therapy and physical therapy. Um, I think that all falls under the same category of physical modalities. So, um, don't, don't rule out chiropractic if you haven't considered it. Okay. These are great questions coming in. <clears throat> what are the side effects of epidural steroid injections? Okay, so um, I think I, I went over in my slides, the side effect of any injection, you know, you're, you're breaking the skin with a needle. So risk of infection and risk of bleeding is always there. Um, very rarely does that happen, but it can definitely happen. Um, the needle could just not go in the wrong place, or I'm sorry, the needle could just not go to the right place. So you, you may not get the medicine where you want it to be. Um, so they may not be helpful. Um, and then of course, there's the side effect of steroids themselves, uh, which I went over as um, difficulty controlling blood sugar, especially if you're diabetic, um, things like insomnia, increased appetite and swelling, facial flushing, those can all happen after a dose of steroids. Um, and then of course, worst case scenario, um, you always have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. If the needle goes into the wrong place, then it's too deep, like it's um, entering the spinal nerve or something like that, um, you can sustain injury to the nerves. Thankfully, I have not seen that in my career so far. What are the side effects of taking daily over-the-counter pain medicine? This is a good question. Um, so maybe two of the common over-the-counter pain medicines are things like Tylenol or Advil, and people will say, oh, I'm worried about my kidneys or I'm worried about my liver. So my general guideline is um, over-the-counter medicines wouldn't be over-the-counter unless they were relatively safe. Um, typically NSAIDs or anti-inflammatories like Advil, um, safe doses, you know, you should talk to your doctor about this, but generally safe doses are like 600, 800 milligrams maximum of Advil three times a day with food as needed. Um, so if you do that for a short period of time, like a week after an acute injury that if you have normal kidneys, that's typically a safe dose. Of course, if you have, uh, you know, a kidney injury or a kidney disease, um, you definitely should tailor that dose with your doctor. Um, and then Tylenol, of course, has a safe maximum dose as well. You don't want to take more than three or four grams of Tylenol maximum per day with a normal liver. And of course, if you have underlying liver disease, 
um, that number should be reduced and you should discuss this with your doctor. If you're using over-the-counter medicines like really, really regularly, like all the time for months and months, that should have been a, a signal to say, hey, you should talk to your specialist, you should talk to your doctor about a better, more sustainable strategy. It's not necessarily, you know, you could take a safe dose of medicine for a long period of time, but it may not be helping um, as much as other strategies that you should consider. Um, and you could also get things like medication overuse headaches. You know, if you use Tylenol or Advil or other similar medicines too much, um, your body can get used to them and it can contribute to an overuse headache and, and other issues. Um, so definitely use them as needed. And if you feel like your pain is kind of refractory to these strategies, that's the time to, to get the opinion of a specialist. Okay, great, great questions. Um, next, where would you expect to feel pain if you had issues with facet joints in the lower lumbar vertebrae? So when people have arthritis in their lumbar spine, super, super common, and especially with age, it's just what happens to us naturally. People will tell me they have sort of a band of, of distribution along their lower back. Sometimes one side's worse than the other, but sometimes it's both sides um, across their lower back. And this can commonly refer down the buttock or the outside of the leg, sometimes to the front of the thigh. It typically doesn't extend past the knee. If there's a back pain that radiates past the knee, that's usually more likely nerve root pain like sciatica. Um, and then again, you're looking for those descriptors of like achy, stiff, um, certain movements are, are difficult, like rotation, twisting of the spine, leaning backwards, crunches on the joints. Those are all good hints that facet joints are the major pain generator. All right, another question. Um, how much does osteoporosis in females contribute to back pain and weakness and core weakness? This is a great question. So osteoporosis by itself, isn't a painful condition. It's really just decreased bone density, um, but it can definitely make people, especially older women, more vulnerable to injury. Um, so for example, I was talking about someone gardening, lifting a heavy bag of soil. If someone has osteoporosis, even lifting something that doesn't seem too, too heavy, that can cause like a compression fracture uh, injury or what we call pathologic fracture. Um, something that shouldn't cause a fracture does because of the underlying osteoporosis. Um, and that can be extremely painful. So osteoporosis doesn't cause weakness by itself, but it may, you know, create more hesitancy around exercise. Um, bones stay strong with gentle weight bearing exercises. So walking is a very common weight bearing exercise. Um, you know, floor exercises with really small weights, like two and a half to five pounds, things that don't feel too strenuous. Those are all helpful to reinforce bone strength. Um, and core exercises can definitely be done gently and safely, as long as you're not doing that bending and lifting and twisting. Um, so definitely if you have osteoporosis, it's even more important to maintain good core strength and bone strength as well with weight bearing exercises. Are there any homeopathic treatments that you would recommend, herbal acupuncture massage? I would say in general, uh, my opinion on homeopathic treatments are that they're very low risk. You know, it's very rare that you're gonna overdose on like a, a supplement, but in general, we don't know how helpful they are. Um, and it's always worth trying. So someone, this question mentions acupuncture. Definitely. That's a modality that can be very helpful and is low risk massage. Absolutely. Um, but things like supplements, you know, I've, I've heard turmeric is, has some anti-inflammatory properties. It does not hurt to take a turmeric supplement. Um, but you just kind of have to explore that on your own. I would say, uh, I would say most pain management physicians don't have a go-to regimen of, um, homeopathic treatments. Um, things like aromatherapy can really help with stress relief, like having lavender, um, things like B vitamins or folate. We know that those are, those are good for nervous system health. Um, magnesium can help with headaches. So, um, making sure you're getting nourishment and getting a, a full battery of multivitamins that is not going to hurt your back pain, but we don't know how much it actually helps. Uh, let's see. How long should I see my PT for lower back pain before seeing a pain specialist? 
I would say it's a team effort. I wanted to, I should have emphasized this more before, but you're hopefully not just seeing one pain doctor and, and going to them for all the answers. Um, it's kind of a team sport. So a physical therapist is a very important person on your back pain management team. And hopefully they're communicating with your pain management doctor, or at least your primary care provider about what progress you're making in PT. Um, and if there's any sort of limiting factors um, that is preventing you from progressing in PT. Um, typically, I think of physical therapy as sort of like, it's a booster. It's not just teaching you how to exercise. A lot of people know how to exercise. It's more like coaching you and encouraging you to incorporate daily home exercises into your own routine. So even after PT, it's expected that you're still doing your physical therapy homework. Um, usual PT courses are maybe six to eight weeks and you're going maybe two times a week, hopefully, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, and hopefully by the end of eight weeks, you have a good understanding of what you could be doing regularly on your own. Um, let's see. If, if a physical therapy gym is offering certain modalities, like sometimes they'll have traction tables or ultrasound or massage or dry needling, um, that's something you could intermittently go back to PT for. But I would say, you know, if PT has been helpful for you, do a booster course of like, you know, six to eight weeks see how you feel, and then hopefully things are improving. And if not, definitely re-strategize with your pain management doctor. All right. Can you have both facet pain and sciatica pain and which injection would help? This is a great question because many people have both facet pain or arthritis pain in their back plus sciatica or nerve pain. Um, and so we, because we see these together all the time, it's really important for you and your doctor to figure out what's bothering you the most. Like what is limiting you more? Is it your morning stiffness and, you know, tolerating a long walk, or is it the nerve pain that's waking you up at night and shooting into your feet? Um, it's kind of a balance because you might want to, you, you might benefit from both types of injections, but you still have to pick which one you want to prioritize first. Um, so that's a great question. And, you know, it's just a matter of working that out with your doctor. Um, can you fully recover from a herniated disc? I would say in general, yes. Um, herniated discs are super common. And, and these are sort of the, the brake pads in between each uh, lumbar vertebral body or, you know, throughout the whole spine. So you have it in your cervical, thoracic and lumbar spine. Um, and discs will pop out of place. You know, ligaments get looser as we age. Um, the discs get less squishy. They can pop out, poke out if you're bending, lifting and twisting. But everything that we do for back pain, anti-inflammatory medicines, gentle core exercises, those all encourage the spine and the disc to kind of pop back into place. So oftentimes, yes, people recover from herniated disc. The exception is when there's been enough trauma or a certain type of trauma such that maybe a part of the disc really like a large part of the disc herniates or a, disc, a part of the disc breaks off and migrates. Sometimes those cannot be addressed with the conservative measures. And that's another time when you might consult with a surgeon to say, hey, this is not gonna solve itself. Um, we may need to physically correct this issue. Um, okay, these are excellent, excellent questions. Just a couple of more here. So um, someone asked, I had scoliosis as, as a child and now I struggle with back pain. Are there any treatments available now as an adult? Um, yes, I see a lot of people with scoliosis who, you know, in their younger years, they were able to handle, uh, the scoliosis for those who don't know scoliosis is when your spine is not perfectly straight and symmetrical, but there's curvature to it. And that can cause an asymmetrical, um, strain on half of your back joints. Um, so I do a lot of facet blocks for scoliosis pain because it's really the joints that have been worn down on the curved side, um, that are sending the pain signals. Physical therapy is a very common strategy for scoliosis associated back pain. Um, Sometimes I'll recommend a back brace uh, if, if the curvature is not so extreme that, you know, you might be recommended surgery. Sometimes a back brace can help correct for that. Um, but you also want to strengthen your core musculature at the same time. Otherwise, if you rely too much on your back brace, um, then that's doing the work that your muscles are doing for you. Okay. I think there's one more question. Um, what do you think about inversion chairs to decompress your spine? Um, I've heard of inversion tables, uh, maybe not chairs, but that's when you basically get into a cot and it like 
tilts you upside down and that can kind of provide traction and elongate the spine. I think by itself, um, as long as you're strapped in safely and, and doing this with the guidance of a physical therapist or a physician, someone who can kind of guide you through this process, uh, it's a relatively safe intervention, but by itself, I don't think it's sort of a, a magic solution. I think you still have to be doing your core exercises. You still have to be doing your PT and you might still need some as needed medicines, um, but it can be part of a good regimen. Um, and I think we may have no other questions and we're, we've reached our one o'clock time uh, so thank you so much for your engaging questions. I can tell you were all listening very actively because your questions were all so good and in depth. Um, but hopefully this was helpful. Thank you so much again for attending. Uh, it's been a pleasure.